Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Draytech technical webinar. Uh, the webinar today is called the Viga 3910 Features and Configuration Tips. Uh, one of our, our higher end products, our high end firewall, uh, uh, quite a lot of things it can do, and we're going to do our best to cram the key features and tips into the one hour session that we've got today. Uh, my name is Julian Hubble, I'm the sales director, and I'll be kind of top and tail in this webinar. And shortly I'll be handing over to Alex Shuka, who's our CTO that will be hosting this webinar today. If I could have the next slide, please. So just to confirm, this is a, it's a technical webinar. It's designed for our reseller partners that uh, we would kind of assume already know a little bit about Draytech products or will be familiar with the range. Uh, and this technical presentation focuses on configuring the 3910 in a lot of common environments. So I just got a tickle in my throat just to take a sip. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the web webinar is being recorded. And it will be available for streaming, the details of which we will let you know after the webinar concludes. So please do ask questions during the chat. And we'll have that Q&A summer at the end. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So I just need to get sitting. Isn't it annoying when that happens? Anyway, so the agenda today is, uh, first of all, we'll have an introduction to the product, just to make sure everyone's familiar with what it is and what it does. Uh, a bit of an area on, on admin, getting the whole kind of thing ready to go. And then we're going to talk about some very specific features. So uh, the wide area network setup, uh, um, very highly featured in that respect with, with four WAN ports. Uh, load balancing, how you can pass traffic across those different, different ports in an effective way. We'll then look at VLANs, a key part of a uh, key feature that many organizations use within the box. But land to land VPN and SSL VT VPN uh, probably can't do this full justice in terms of total setup because these are quite complex areas in their own right and probably would almost require a webinar each. But we will give you a guide on that and I can kind of get you going if you need to make those uh, types of config setup changes. Then we'll do a bit of troubleshooting and finally uh, we'll have the QA. Um, so that's what we got today. Uh, I hope you find this useful. And we, we estimate we'll be talking for around about an hour, just, just so you all know. So without further ado, let me hand you over to your host, Alex, who will take it from here. Alex. Thank you very much, Julian. Hello, everyone. And yes, today the topic is the Vigor 3910, our highest performance router firewall to date. And we just want to start off by just taking a look at it, some of the interfaces. Uh, Julian mentioned four WAN ports, but Actually, there's a few more because of the multi-configuration uh, way of it, where you can you can switch the the configuration of some ports. You can turn them from LAN to WAN. So I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in, in the fall. But just some kind of top level figures are kind of on here. Um, it's got different interface types. Uh, we've got SFP plus, so it supports up to 10 gig interface there. 2.5 gig Ethernet ports, RT45 presentation and then also one gigabit ethernet ports as well uh, it's really kind of well designed to to help scale so it's, it's quite good if you've got a a decent connection but then if it then if that connection gets upgraded it's got the the horsepower to to really see you through um growing the your business and and as you uh, have increase in the kind of bandwidth requirements that you have it's quite well featured it's it's got kind of all the sort of bells and whistles of, of the the Draytech range and also has some additional stuff that, that you, you don't generally see in some of the other models like it can actually act as a PPPoE server with 200 user accounts has many VLANs that are supported and also BGP and OSPF routing functionality as well and um, a slight difference is the digital configuration files which can be can be useful if you're doing multiple different units and one of the key parts is it's VPN performance and ability to uh, act as a kind of HQ for many, many tunnels and also has the throughput to back that up as well so that it can have a, have a lot of um, throughput thrown at it from other connecting sites. So let's just look a little bit more at the front panel. So here's the front panel on the device. I've got labeled one, two and three here, the kind of 
uh, LEDs, the USB ports and the console port. Console ports for out-of-band management, so you can connect to that to, to get to the command line if you want to, but you wouldn't typically need to. The, the router supports a, a web interface that you can manage through HTTPS as well, so that's the normal way that most people would, would do the configuration. And then if we look at the, the WAN and LAN interfaces, we've got uh, number four labeled here a two SFP plus ports so they're switchable as LAN or one and then we have the two 2.5 gig RJ45 ports there and then we have the one gig ports there's four in the first bank there and then another four in the second bank the second bank are dedicated to be LAN ports and the first bank are switchable as LAN or one so that's a, a quick look at the interface uh, the kind of in the kind of flexibility of that means that you can have multiple different interfaces for the, for the WAN. In total, you can have six uh, WAN connections that are RJ45 and then eight WAN connections in total if you include the two SFP plus ports. That means you could have it low balance in multiple different connections, kind of maybe uh, fiber, uh, ethernet, uh, uh, VDSL modems, uh, it's kind of lease lines, all, all sorts are quite good and it's got uh, failover and low balancing policy that you can put in it so that you can have it so it's low balancing those or failing over from one one to another, which we'll, we'll look at some of the config on that a little bit later. Another uh, thing that's that's worth mentioning on the Fed 10 is high availability, as it's the, the central device and, and uh, uh, if it goes down, it would if there's some sort of hardware failure, then it would be an issue. So that that's why you can um, have two devices uh, in a high availability mode, so that if there is some sort of power issue to the first device, say the second device can kick in as a standby and then take over um, reasonably seamlessly without any intervention by the administrator. So that's a really good uh, method. There's two methods of the standby: hot standby and active standby. Hot standby um, has it kicking in when active is uh, where it is already active so the different methods um, depending on, on on what you want to use uh, you can have it so that they're all using the same internet connection or you can have it as different internet connections for each of the two devices um, depending on on, on the, the scenario on the SFP connectivity uh, we do supply uh, direct catch cables that you can use I mean they're pretty generic the ports so you can use most off-the-shelf uh, SFP plus ports then we, we don't code anything so it doesn't have to be a specific direct tech cable for it to work so you can go and get any kind of generic SFP plus cable and that will uh, work with with the products but uh, we do um, in, in the range have the, the CX10 SFP direct to catch cables as an accessory that you can get they're available in three and one meter length so it's a really easy way the direct to catch cable means that it's just a, a solid cable going from one to another so you don't have to worry about kind of putting in the, the, the fiber connectors or anything like that um, so that's really good if you want the specific length if you want longer then you then you'd you probably look at um, a, a this different SFP but you can get those um, available from from many different kind of vendors and and those will uh, very likely be compatible with with the uh, 3910. It's very useful on the LAN side if you're uplinking it to to a switch for example the uh, Vico switch 2280x series uh, supports SFP plus so, so that gives you a high speed uplink to the rest of the LAN. And if we just take a quick look at the performance, um, the 3910, as I said, is the top of the range performance-wise in, 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 in the product range. It supports uh, 10 gig of total throughput or, or um, 9 gig for a, an individual single WAN. Um, so that's why we, we sometimes publish the, the two different figures. So if you're looking at it across all of the different WAN ports you could get combined through of around uh, 10 gig but uh, on any individual one connection so if you had just one one connection it will give you about uh, nine nine gig on that one one connection if you compare it to the other models you can see it's well ahead of the uh, of a product in the range which are, i'm not really slow um, but uh, it's just a, it kind of has that extra horsepower which means that uh, with the say the 2927 you'd, you'd have something that's a, a few hundred meg um, if you uh, wanted to have multiple of those connections and the, the 3910 is really appropriate if you had, had to say two or three um, full fiber connections then that that's the best way to do it is to have a 3910 and, and load balancer and also on the IPsec and uh, SSL performance the what we're seeing is an increased demand on the HQ as 
other remote sites start getting vast internet connections, the bottleneck starts, bottleneck starts to become the headquarters. So the Fraternal 10 has the, the IPsec performance and also for remote clients, the SSL performance to cater for with giving more users a faster a connection speed and experience. And on NAT sessions, uh, it's uh, up to one meg, one million uh, NAT sessions. It's configurable. You can you can set it in the interface because it depends how much memory you want to assign to it. So you've got 150k up to uh, one million that you can set. I'll talk about how you set that later in the presentation. So I just want to just touch on a few of the different application types of scenarios where you might want to use the product. Uh, one is, as I mentioned, at headquarters, very common where you've got multiple remote sites, either home workers, mobile users, or, or remote offices uh, with, with the 3910 login. So that's a really common scenario. And also as an enterprise gateway. Uh, so you've got the good connectivity onto the, the LAN switch, and then uh, you can um, have it as a, a fast internet connection and, and also have the, the remote sites. Another is uh, load balancing. Sometimes people might want to load balance multiple uh, slower connections. You, you could put three, four uh, uh, um, VDSL connections via the Viga 130 modem, say, uh, put that into the, the, the 3910, and then combined you can get, get faster connection if, if it's in an area which is unfortunately unable to uh, get fiber speeds, then you can use this to, to load balance to get faster connections. They'd be individual connections, but the router would load balance it so that you've got a, a greater total capacity available to the network, but any individual download would, would be limited to the download speed of, of any individual connection. Another really uh, common scenario where, where the 3910 is, is, is really uh, well suited is in multi-tenant environments. You could put the 3910 as the, the main router for the building and then using the VLAN facility with up to 100 subnets and VLANing possibly with maybe a Dratic switch, then have separation between all the different LANs so that it could be for maybe a managed office or or different uh, apartments in, in a building would allow the, that router to, to provide the internet connection for all of those and separate it. And then there's a resource Q QS and another resource uh, management tools that you've got to make sure that people are able to be given uh, the, the right amount of bandwidth so that um, no one just steals all the bandwidth. There's also a lot more features. Uh, I'm not going to cover all of them uh, uh, now in this presentation because I want to focus a little bit on the, some of the presentation, but there's some other webinars we've done uh, that are available that, that go into uh, some of the, the details on, on the 3910 and some of the other applications as well in our fiber webinar that we talk about uh, some of the central management, content filtering. Uh, Dre DNS, uh, all those other things. So um, if you're looking for more information on that, there, there's some other um, presentations that we've got that, that go into more detail on this. So the um, next thing I'd like to look at is some demonstrations. So to start off with, I'd just like to have a bit of an orientation, uh, take a look at the interface and and, and how you would um, navigate around the 3910. The 3910 is a successor to some products that used a slightly different interface to the rest of the Draytech range. Uh, if you're familiar with Draytech, you, you'll probably have heard the term Draos before, which is our, our main operating system. And most of the products, the, the 28 series and the 29 series of routers all share the same interface. The 3910 also shares that interface. Uh, the older products, the 3300V and the 3900 were slightly different, which made it a little bit more of a challenge to pick up the higher end firewalls because they were slightly different. So you had to learn uh, the, the different quirks of how it's different. But the 3910 is completely the same. So you'll be very at home if you're used to configuring a, a 2860 or 20. 862, 2865, it will be very, very similar to how the 3910 is configured. So if we log in and look at the web interface, here you can see when you first log in, you get the, the dashboard, which has the port status. These are live ports, so it will show you what's connected and what isn't. It also shows colors for the connection speeds, which is very helpful. It has system information, uptime, and firmware versions, and, and various system resources. In the top right, you'll see there's some icons. I'll just talk you through what those do. The uh, first one on the left is a home button, which just takes you to the Drayton website. But the second one is a GUI map, which has a basically map of all the different menus. So you can use this to 
find a menu that you're looking for. Uh, I tend to just use the search on the left-hand side. Uh, you'll, you'll spot that when I go back to it. There's a, a search function, so you can type in a, a term and, and you can find the menu. So I tend to use that more than the, the GUI map anymore that uh, it is there uh, if you want to use it. And then the next icon is a web console. This loads the uh, shell on the router, but in the web interface. So you don't have to kind of use Putty or something to open up SSH. You can just type some commands directly into the web interface. You wouldn't typically need to. Um, because you can do most things via the web interface, but but it is there if you do want to log on and 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 type commands in. It's a a handy quick way to do that. The next icon is to save the config. So if you click on that, it will uh, download the config file to your web browser. So it's a handy way to quickly save the config rather than having to navigate to the config backup menu. And the other icon there is a manual download. So if you click on that, it'll, it'll download the latest manual from the website as a PDF, um, which can be good for, for reference. And the, the last icon is uh, to log off the unit, which is a good practice once you're finished so that uh, it, 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 it kind of stops anyone else from using the, uh, if you leave the machine unattended or uh, for cross-site scripting stuff, it's a good practice to protect yourself against that. And if we um, look at the, dashboard again you can see the search menu on the left hand side has the, uh, the the search function where you can type in the command to, to find the different sub menus uh, which is quite handy for finding something if you're unsure which exact menu the, uh, the, the the item you're looking for is in another really useful thing to look at is the online status page that's on the top left if I just show you that and go to physical connection that shows you the one connections and uh, you can see the the different uh, and, and land status is there and also at the bottom there's a uh, potentially the VDS information if you've connected a, a Graytech modem to it as well. And another item that's worth being aware of is the system maintenance and management. That's where you can control the management ports, uh, access control list and the router's name. Uh, very useful if you've got multiple devices to, to set the, the router name as a so you so you know you can differentiate between different different devices. And config wise you can back up the config through the system maintenance as well. And you can encrypt the config, but also you can edit it uh, if you look at the config it's it's in, in binary so it makes it possible to to use a config and then put it to a, a different router and, and change a few key values if you want to um, so that that can be handy that's something you can't do on the other models so that's a, a quick tour of the kind of routers interface i'd like to now look at some uh, general wan setup stuff so let's first look at some uh, general interface setup stuff and then we'll go on to different WAN scenarios. So first thing is to uh, decide how to configure the different ports. This is done through the port setup menu. When you click in there, you've got uh, a menu where it has each of the ports and it can you can control what function they have and what speed they're set to. You can drop it down and select the, which function you want. And if you select it to LAN, it will then change in the dashboard at the top in, in the, uh, the the graphic will, will, will correspond to how it's set which is quite useful and if you ever go back to the main dashboard it will it will um, correlate as well so that's a, a really useful way of um, quickly checking to see which which one one of the the things that's slightly different is that typically you'll use WAN 5 as your primary one because that's the first one gig port um, so WAN 1 would only be if you've got an SFP plus into into connected to P1 because the, the one naming is fixed it's um uh one one is always p1 and one five is always always p5 even if you have the uh first one set as a lan it will still uh keep those one names reserved so so it doesn't ever switch the one names around and the groups are sometimes changed as a group so ports five six seven eight are all shaded in blue here are settable as LAN or WAN. Uh, if you change it to LAN, then it changes the whole group and then it will show it on the dashboard as well. And the same for this red group, but this is for the speed. So the 2.5 gig ports there are set to auto by default, but if you set it to 2.5, then it will set both of them to fixed as 2.5. You don't need to do this, you should auto negotiate, but if you do that, if there's some negotiation issue and the, the device you're connecting it to uh, doesn't auto negotiate and needs to be set fixed to 2.5, you can you can set that then there 
on the thing, but you can have port three and port four as, as WAN and LAN separate to, to each other. And here's just a, a recap of the different things. So the first four are switchable as LAN or WAN, the next four are grouped, so we'll all we'll take the same configuration, and the, the last four are dedicated, so it can only ever be as LAN ports. So that gives us a total of, of eight WAN ports in total, two of which are SFP, so that means we've got six RJ45 presentation ports um, in, in total. So if we um, go back to the dashboard, you can see uh, the WAN interfaces there on the top, and also in the interaccess mode at the bottom here, you can see the LANs. There's some numbers missing here, so you, WAN 2's not there, uh, WAN 4's not there because that's set to a LAN, LAN port. And you can see the, the, the LAN interfaces if you um, go to the uh, LAN, LAN VLAN, uh, you can see what the, the, the LAN ports there. I'll cover the, the VLAN in, in a separate section. We'll go into, into that on how you, you set the, the LAN side up. So let's now look at a uh, common uh, setup scenario, which is using it with fiber to the premises, so, so full fiber. Often the uh, ISP um, uh, would be providing you with an ONT from the network uh, operator. So someone like OpenReach will provide an ONT with kind of Ethernet presentation and there'd be fiber optic that goes to the uh, splice point and then up into the rest of the, the network. And the router would connect via RJ45 to one of the ports. So the FTP setup is quite straightforward on the router. We go into WAN and internet access and then select the WAN port that we've connected the ONT to and select it to PPPoE. Then go into the details page and in there we enable that and select the username password. Uh, the username you know, password would normally be provided by ISP but there are some kind of gen generic ones uh, with, with, with some, some ISPs um, but it kind of depends. Sometimes it's generic or sometimes it's a specific one um, and then uh, that will be enough to to get you online typically there is a vlan setup that you can do but this isn't necessarily required it's only for some isps it's not required on kind of bt or open reach connections um you, you don't typically need it but it does depend on the isp so if the isp say that you need to set a one vlan tag then you can do this in the one general setup and then go into the one there and then enable the vlan tag insertion and then just put the the tag value and that's just only sent on the one side so that's an optional step that's sometimes required for, for some ISPs but uh, on FTP not generally many of them then once uh, that's online if you look at the online status you'll see in the one five it's, it's set you can see the line is set to Ethernet and the mode is PPPoE and then we can see the IP address and the uptime Another common setup is with VDSL. Sometimes as a backup, you might have FTTP as your primary and then want to have a, a backup connection of a different type. A really handy way of doing that because the Vigal 3910 doesn't have a built-in DSL modem is to use the Vigal 130 or Vigal 166 modems. And in this scenario, the internet connection goes directly into the Vigal 130 modem, uh, a VDSL line, and then there's an Ethernet presentation from the Vigal 130 to the 3910. And the 3910 deals with the credentials, the Vigon 30 just acts in a in a in a bridge mode uh, and acts just as a modem. So it doesn't actually do any any routing really. Uh, it's it's all left to the to the 3910 to do the authentication and, and logging in. So the setup on that is that we go into WAN Internet Access and again set PPPoE and then set the username password as, as before. So it's very similar to how you do on 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 FTTP. There's on VDSL, typically a VLAN tag of 101, but that's by default set already in the Vigal 130, so you don't need to set it on the 3910. You can, if you wanted to, remove it from the Vigal 130 and set it on the 3910, but you don't need to. Uh, so, so you don't, with, with VDSL, need to set a VLAN tag on the, the 3910 because that's all taken care of on, on the Vigal 130 or, or 166 modems. If you're in a different region uh, where, for example, in Ireland with AIR, they, they use a different VLAN tag, you need to log into the Vigal 130 to change that tag um, because the default is, is, is 101 with the way that they ship. And then once you've, you've got the setup, you'll be able to see in the online status page that the WAN connection 
but also additionally you can see the VDSL information if you look at the bottom here we've got the remote VDSL information from 1.5 which is pulling from the Pygon 30 modem and it shows us the down speed and up speed which is quite useful information to see what what rate is getting and also if there was a an issue with the sync you'd see if it didn't have sync so that's quite helpful for troubleshoot next uh, connection I want to talk about is just Ethernet one. So this would be maybe if there was some sort of RJ45 or SFP plus presentation, maybe it's an active fiber with an upstream router that's connected, maybe a lease line. Um, so in that scenario, you would connect the router via the RJ45 or SFP and typically you would set it to a, a static or dynamic uh, setup. So go into WAN internet access, and then the same menu, and then in the specified IP, put in the IP details that you've been given by the SP. So IP address, subnet mask, and the gateway address, and that will get you online. In some cases, it might be assigned by by DHCP, but typically for for lease lines, it's kind of something where you 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 give the IP range, you, you set it manually on on there, and in some cases, you then have a, a, a range of subnets that you can route through behind the the LAN. And the last um, setup I wanted to talk about is bridge mode. So the uh, 4G uh, is quite useful for uh, mobile broadband. It, it's quite useful as a, as a backup connection, but it's quite difficult to get it into to cabinets. Sometimes the signal strength isn't good enough. But there's a way of with the Vigor one, uh, Vigor 2620 LN, setting it into a bridge mode so that you can run an Ethernet cable to somewhere near the edge of the building where you place the the modem, and it will then get a strong signal, and then you can uh, have your your third line to end in, in the cabinet and, and then use that as an additional internet connection. The 2620 takes a couple of SIM slots, so, so you put a SIM card in there and you need credit on the SIM to get into connection. So to set up, you have to go into the 2620 because it can act as a router, it's on light and it's on a right, but you've set it into a, a, a bridge mode. First, what I would do is check that I've got good signal strength. So you can go to go to the LTE and status page there and just check to see that the signal strength is showing uh, kind of uh, a good or something. But uh, just to, you can play around with the different positions to, to get the, the best um, strength and then you can see what rates it's, it's showing. And then go into one general setup and in the LTE setup, make sure it's set to always on so that it keeps the connection connected permanently. Uh, otherwise, it would try and use the DSL interface and then go into Internet Access LTE set it to uh, the, the 4G DHCP mode, go into details and then enable the bridge mode and then you select which LAN and then you would plug P1 from the 2620 into the one interface of the 3910 and you would need to set the appropriate APN name. There is an auto detect APN name but you can override that by ticking the disable auto VPN and putting in the correct a, um, APN name for the uh, SIM that you're using. There's kind of a list on our, our site of the, the, the common APN names as well, if you want to refer to that. And then on the 3910 setup, it's just a case of going to one internet access and setting it to obtain an IP address automatically. And it will then be given an IP by the 2620 LN if the 2620 LN is online. So that's a, a useful uh, way of getting uh, 4G onto the uh, 3910. So with all of these connections, I think one of the things to look at is how the load balancing works. Uh, so we'll look at the load balance pool and some stuff on the uh, load balancing and route policy. So first thing is to go to WAN general and decide if you want to have a WAN as a member of the load balance pool. By default, they are. Uh, so uh, they, they have a, a V ticked there. But to disable that, just go click on the uh, WAN index and then untick the load balance and that will disable a load balancing. There's also an advanced button you can see there. This allows you to override load balancing for specific traffic types. Um, so um, there's some protocols that don't deal well with load balancing. So you can set it so that for these protocols, it, it consistently just uses the first, the one that it's routed over rather than it possibly routing it to different ones for different uh, uh, sessions. So that's there. So that can help sometimes with um, uh, SIP phones especially because um, that, that they might not cater for um, having the, the sessions on, on different WAN connections. Then the other part of load balancing is the load balance route policy. This allows you to have more control over which WAN interfaces are used. If you go into routing load balance there, you've got many different profiles that you can set. 
I don't have the time to be able to go through every a lot of scenarios on this, but I wanted to talk you through the interface and just some of the things that you can do. So if we look at an index, we can enable it and put a comment that's just for your reference. And then there's protocols that you can set. So we can set TCP or UDP, TCP and UDP or ICMP. And then we set the source IP or we can set it to any, but there's also ranges you can set. So there's an IP object, an IP group that you can set up so that it can then have a number of different uh, IP objects, or you can have an IP group of many IP objects to apply to this low balance policy. And on the destination, you can set um, any or an IP range, IP subnet, or a domain name. So that means you can put a fully qualified domain name. So um, for example, a, a website, and then that would apply to send traffic to that website via the specific one that you're selecting. Same with IP and IP group. And then there's also a country object. So for destination to a specific country, you can set it via a specific one. And uh, then destination port, you can have any or a destination port range. And then in the interfaces, there's a very large list um, because of there's so many interfaces. And also it can set it by the one or the LAN. So you've got the, the list of every single interface on here, including the LAN and one interfaces you can select from the drop down. And then at the bottom, we got the priority because uh, there's different entries that might be in the routing table. A uh, low balance policy rule that you create, you can decide what priority it has. The default route is 250, so this is the lowest. So if no other policy supply, it will use the default route policy. Uh, 150 is the default for any entries that are put in the routing table. So any land to land VPN would get a, a policy of 150 automatically. And then you can select for a low balance policy to decide what priority. If it is lower than 150, so that's a, may say 200, then um, that would mean that the policy, the, the, the root table would take precedence over the policy you've created. But if you want to make the policy have higher priority, move it to move the slider across to the higher select and then it'll get a, a smaller number, but that is a, a, high, a higher priority, uh, which is slightly counterintuitive, but it, that's why we've got the, the low and the high. So you'd slide it towards the high to give it Greater precedence so that it goes up the pecking order in the um, order of how the router uh, interprets having multiple policies that would apply to traffic to, to, to decide which one to use. For this, you can, um, if you're trying to understand what it is doing, you can go to diagnostics and root policy. Diagnostics is really useful. You can put in the packet information as an example and then hit out analyze and it will then tell you which routes match, which policies matched, and then the final decision. In this example, uh, it matched on a, a route. Uh, there was no policy and it would have sent it via one five according to that static route. So that, that's really handy for, for kind of unpicking how the, the, the routing is, is working. So that's the uh, set up there. I just want to now look at some of the VLAN setup on the, the, the LAN side. There's two main ways you can do port based or tag based. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's 100 VLANs that are supported. So it allows you to have multiple virtual LANs, so uh, multiple different networks um, on, on the router. One way is to have it with an 802Q um, switch, which supports VLAN tagging. Uh, but the alternative way is just to use the uh, ports on, on the router itself to separate the LANs. So let's first look at port based setup. So we go into LAN and VLAN and then we check which ports uh, each subnet has. So in this example we've put port 2, 10, 11, 12 into LAN 1 and port 4 is in LAN 2 and port 9 is in LAN 3. So that uh, if we plug into port 4 we're, we're in the LAN 2 subnet. Then when you click OK to save that it will give you a warning uh, because if those subnets are not enabled yet, it, it gives you an option to enable them with a tip box. What you can do, and I typically would do, is click on the LAN general setup on there because you've, when once you've clicked OK on the previous page, it's now saved it, but then you can go into LAN general setup and then set the LANs. If you click on the OK button at the bottom, it will then reboot uh, to uh, apply the changes, but you can abort, you can defer the reboot. So you can go and do other setups. You go into LAN general setup, complete this, the setup there, and then reboot to apply everything in one go rather than having to reboot it um, a few times. And then once that's set, you'll then uh, um, see see the uh, in the LAN general, the LANs that are enabled, and also you can uh, see the interlan routing. So that table increases as more subnets are enabled. It allows you to allow traffic from one LAN to communicate with another LAN if you, if you wish that. 
and you can see in system status the lands that are enabled so if you go to system maintenance system status there's a land and one section so in the land section you can see which lands are enabled and also the router's ip on each of those lands so that's port based we can do tag based as well so we can go into the vlan configuration and set uh, vlan tags here i've got uh lands one two and three that those subnets enabled um and I've got VLAN 0 set to LAN 1, VLAN 1 set to LAN 2, and VLAN 2 set to, to LAN 3. It's just slightly weird that the, the VLAN start at 0 and the LAN start at 1. So that's something to bear in mind when you're doing the setup. But here I've got uh, port 2 set as kind of a trunk port with it being a member of all the different subnets. And we can see that we got untagged on the first and then uh, attack of 10 on VLAN 1 and attack of 20 on VLAN 2. So for this to work, we need to use in conjunction with a switch. So if we use one of our Drayton micro switches, we'd go in there and create the appropriate VLANs. So we go to VLAN management and create some VLANs. Uh, there's some, I'm there's not going into a lot of detail on this, but there is, there is more resources available online for this setup. Um, but what you do is um, here we got VLAN one is LAN two, which is VID ten. So we'd set that up on the Vigo switch. So we would add VLAN ID ten and add VLAN ID. 20. I typically, when I do it, I, the VLAN name, I call it the, the the subnet. So I've got LAN 2 and LAN 3. I think I find that easier rather than calling it the the, the <clears throat> VLAN um, number. I call it the, the, the subnet. And then you would, on the switch, set the trunk port. Let's say we've got port 50 plugged into port 2 on the router. We would need to make sure that the tag VLAN is set to LAN 10 and 20 on that. And then any PCs we plug into ports on the switch, we'd need to set those to an access port and then set their appropriate port VID if the PC is not VLAN tag aware. So that means that when a PC is plugged into LAN 2 in this example, uh, port 2 will add a VLAN tag of 10, which will then put it into uh, LAN 2. And if it gets a VLAN tag of 20, then it will put it into uh, LAN, LAN 3 automatically. So we're controlling which LAN based on the individual ports. So that's a, uh, a kind of a, a, a brief explanation of, of the uh, setup there. There's a lot more detail with VLANs, um, but we've got, got a kind of other, other presentations that, that cover this in a lot more depth with the Vigor switches. So now just talk about IPsec VPN. So LAN to LAN VPN is really common. Um, so kind of 500 VPN tunnels is a good number of tunnels that supported. The other products are kind of in the range typically do around 32 VPN tunnels uh, or up to 300 megs on other models. Or in the, with hardware acceleration enabled on some of the other models, it's kind of up to around, around 800. Um, but a, the 3910 on is r really good when it comes to the, the total capabilities. Want to show you the uh, land to land setup. I, it would be too long to explain a full land to land setup in this presentation. I don't think we've we've fully got the time, but I wanted to show you the land to land profiles and uh, how how you get into those. So you go into remote access and land to land, and in the land to land profiles, you've got all of the profiles there. You can see there's uh, up to uh, 500 profiles that you can set up, and you can click on the buttons along the top to change the tab. And then we go into one of those tabs. You can see it's very similar to the um, view that you'd see on any other uh, Draytech model. So the um, setup guides we got for all of our uh, products would apply to the Veta 910 in exactly the same way. Uh, so you kind of enable it, give a profile name, and could to choose the call direction. Often it would be dial in for the uh, headquarters router where it's waiting for other devices to contact it. And um, if you want more information about um, the land to land setup, uh, do see our guides or, or our, our, our videos on our, our VPN setup. And SSL VPN, uh, again, the um, number of tunnels is, is much better and uh, the, the number of the, the kind of throughput is uh, much exceeds it. The um, kind of one gig throughput compared to, I think it's about 130 meg for the other range. So um, although they, they can, in some cases, it might not be the number of VPN tunnels. It might be the throughput performance as people have faster connections. Uh, that's putting more demand on the, the, the router as the SSL VPN server. The setup on here is, is is quite straightforward and exactly the same as the others. We've got a, a nice guide on 
the site on how to set up SSL teleworkers and also how to configure the SSL clients. We've got some clients for Windows and for Mac, uh, which you can download. Also, you for your phone, you can download an, uh, an app from the app stores uh, to do the setup on, on there. And it allows you to use uh, internal or, uh, user accounts, or also you can use external uh, accounts as well uh, if you've got a radio server. And also there's um, one-time passwords as well, MOTP supported, which you can enable to add an additional layer of authentication. So let's now look at some of the troubleshooting stuff. So, and troubleshooting, uh, it's very similar to the rest of the Dratit range. If you look at the diagnostics menus, they've, they've got the same sort of uh, items there, but there's a few additional ones that are specific to Vertline 10, which are quite handy, which I wanted to, to, to specifically cover. But on the, the general thing, we've got the diagnostics and uh, you go to things like routing table where you can, can see the information on there. So those are quite useful. Uh, as I mentioned before, the load balancing diagnostics is a really useful thing for, for going through. So that's in diagnostics and root policy diagnostics, but also there is a firewall diagnostics as well. That's in the firewall and diagnose. It's a slightly different menu, but it, it, it is there. So that can help you with any IP filter rules to try and understand if the router is or isn't stopping traffic. So uh, you can go in there, select a source and destination IP, and you can put a Mac in if you want, but that's not, not required. You can just put the source and destination IP, and then it will look at all the firewall rules and analyze and tell you if the firewall would, would um, allow or, or block the traffic. So I mentioned earlier about NAT sessions. So one of the things that can be, if there's a lot of devices on the, on the site, uh, it's possible if there's many hundred devices that they could uh, reach the MAT session number. So you can increase this. So by default, it's 150, but you could set that to 300, 500, or, or even a million. Uh, it's recommended to choose the lowest number that's needed for your requirements because the higher the session reserves more memory. Um, so that might leave less memory available for other features. Uh, I, I think that's only going to be an issue memory wise if you're setting up a, a large number of profiles uh, on there. But you can monitor the memory usage in the uh, on the dashboard uh, to see the effect of, of changing the, the, the NAT sessions and, and what else you happen to have configured. So I mentioned that there are different things on, on the 3910 that, that's, that's unique to it. One is the um, packet capture function. So in diagnostics and port mirror packet capture, we actually have the ability to download a, a, a PCAP file, which is a packet trace of all the traffic rather than having to have a, a separate device on the network, which is really handy for troubleshooting. So you can go in there, um, select a port to be the uh, port you're, you're monitoring and then download a cap, or you can do a traditional one where you're plugging in a PC and um, sending it to the mirror port. So you plug a PC in, run something like Wireshark on that PC, and then um, that is the mirror port, and then you choose which ports you're replicating the traffic from. Um, but uh, the ability to download a PCAP directly is really handy for remote troubleshooting. And also there's a debug log section as well. Uh, this is something that you typically wouldn't need to use, but it is something that if engineering requests it, they, they, might, they might ask for this, but it, this allows us to um, more quickly uh, resolve any issues if there happen to be, be some specific um, issue found on, on a site, then it allows us to, to get a lot of uh, logs there that can help with uh, coming up with a resolution uh, quicker, which is um, an, a nice uh, function. So that's all the kind of troubleshooting stuff on there. To, to um, round up by just talking about the, the router AP management, um, there's also um, switch management as well, but uh, on the the um, Viagor Fertan 10, it can support up to 50 uh, APs. So you can in the uh, in the root in the Fertan 10 uh, select set it up so that you can configure and the profiles on the router and push those to all the different APs that are on site. So it acts as a kind of a, a little uh, kind of AP controller as well, which is quite a neat additional feature that I just wanted to kind of uh, mention at, at the end there. So, but that um, kind of covers everything on the 3910 that I wanted to 
present to you today. There's a lot of additional resources uh, available online and also there's some other webinars that talk about some other stuff related to fiber where the, the 3910 is kind of covered as well which, which might be of interest. But uh, I'm going to now go on to the next slide. I believe Julian you might be able to come in. You had some stuff you wanted to talk about these yeah, APs. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, of course. So thank you very much, Alex, for an excellent webinar and uh, well done for getting through all that material in 45 minutes and that was quite a challenge to do that. So for everybody um, listening, clearly we went through quite a lot on that webinar, but just to remind you all this is recorded so you can go back and look at it and, uh, and uh, you know, learn again at your leisure should you so wish. But really, really hope you found, found that useful and thanks for your attention today. Um, before we go on to just some of the questions. I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to remind you of a few things. Um, you're probably aware that there's been a, a sort of shortage of product in the industry. Um, I'm sure all of you have been exposed to that. Uh, unfortunately, we're not immune to that either. But uh, one thing I wanted to just let you all know is is that when it, when it comes to running out access points, and Alex just kind of mentioned APs and management through the 3910. Um, there is generally a shortage of power ev over Ethernet switches in the industry, we understand. We're, we're affected by that, and I think many other suppliers of PoE switches are similarly affected. Um, one thing we do have on our access points, which I think is, I, I'm not saying it's 100% unique, but I don't think many other uh, equivalent access points have the same thing. But basically, the vast majority of our access points come uh, with a power supply that you can just plug into the wall. Um, specifically, we're talking about the AP912C, which is our, rack mount, um, our ceiling mounted device, and also the 903, and, and also the rugged outdoor device, the, the 918. So if you do have um, AP installations that are being hampered because you haven't got PoE switches, this could be a possible alternative to get your network up and running, you know, while the PoE switch eventually comes through. Obviously, with a ceiling mounted device, it depends what sort of gap you've got between that device and where the power socket is but uh, hopefully that's useful to you it's pointed out to us recently that's actually quite a good thing to have in these times so I, I thought I'd use this opportunity yeah just to let you all know in case there's any confusion on that particular side so uh, yeah for the next slide Alex we'll just um, go through some of the uh, some of the questions we've had we've had quite a few which is always very good to see um, the first one yeah, absolutely. Um, the first one um, sort of picks up on the theme of um, 2860, sorry, the 3910 having um, similar look and feel to the 2865 and our other business class routers. And there's, there's a question here about uh, when are some of the features we get in our 2865, for example, going to be available on the 3910? And they're referring specifically to the config auto backup on the USB and the security TLS. 1.3 support. So I wondered uh, if you could if you could comment on that. Yes, those are features that are being looked at by engineering. I don't, off the top of my head, know the exact schedule and roadmap wise for when which firmware version these are going to be in. But that is something that is kind of uh, I'd expect to see it in the future. Um, right. I right. wonder whether or not we might be able to send to follow up on, on, on a couple of those because we just need to look, to, to look up the, the, the roadmap to see uh, what what the kind of current plans see if there's anything specifically scheduled for those or not, or not yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I would expect to see those come, especially as they're in the other range, it kind of shares it. It's, it's often a case that it gets developed to one and then gets kind of um, added to, to the other DREOS models in, in, as time goes on. So there's yeah, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag between one, one or yeah. other. Um, but I think in some of these examples, there might have been a little bit of a delay, but I'll, we'll, we'll check on yeah. the schedule and we might be yeah, able to I guess, Obviously, 3910 has a lot more features than some of the other others, so I guess there's always going to be a slight difference there. But yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that response. There. Um, the other question is, regard, is regarding the uh, router's sort of management capability. Obviously, most people know we have our ACS central management system, but in these higher-end devices, you can also use that as your management console, if you like. And uh, you went through, I think, access points, saying you could manage up to 50 access points from the 3910, if my memory serves me right. Uh, there's a question on switches. Um, so, yeah, how many switches are supported by uh, the central management switch management on the 3910? Yes, that's up to 30 switches 
which I think has hopefully more switches than you'd ever need on a, on a single site. But um, yes, that that's that's the, the number that's supported. It's uh, the same switch management sort of functionalities you, you see on, on a lot of yeah. the other Dreos models. Okay, so that's natty for a sort of mid-size sort of installation. You can, you can have your router and you can manage your switches and access points from the same central point. Mm. Uh, guess, yep. guess, guess a neat feature there. Okay. Um, another one, perhaps a little more complex one now. A question is, uh, is it possible to have all WAN connections active simultaneously? I suppose that's the fir first part of the question. And then load balance the traffic to specific local networks when failovers, uh, with, with failovers when needed. So I guess it's a kind of uh, root policy type question as well. So do you want to mm. have a go at answering that one? <laughs> yeah, so the you can pick and mix with that. So you can have all, all the WAN connections being load balanced and then have specific local network subnets with load balance rules that allow you to then um, uh, kind of fail over. Although if you have a load balance policy, then it will pick one WAN for that subnet. So it won't load balance multiple LANs. I'm sorry. If you have a load balance policy for a subnet, then it will pick one WAN that it sends the traffic over rather than load balancing across all the WANs, if I've explained right. that. Um, Understood, yes, yes. Correctly, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, okay, uh, okay so, yeah, so uh, as, as ever some complexity in it, but uh, the, the principle, yes, you can do that. So, okay. yeah, it, it, yeah, if you don't put a rule in, then it can load balance across the all. If you have a rule, then it, you're actually pinning a WAN connection for that subnet. And But then if that WAN is down, you can then fail over to a, a different subnet. I mean, a different okay. one connection. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Okay. Um, so there's another question with with regard to web content filtering. So obviously there's a bit of that involved in the product, and there's also, uh, of course, uh, our uh, W2F, our web content filtering subscription service. I'm not sure you had a chance to cover today, but uh, that's something that obviously you can do. So the question here is, can we have multiple web content filtering profiles? For business and guest subnets, so I guess uh, you'd want web content filter or web content filtering profile A for the business guys, and something perhaps a little bit more stringent for guests. Yes, that's that's definitely possible. Yeah, you can have uh, multiple profiles, and you can then uh, you only need to activate one license. So once you've got a license, that applies to the router, and then any devices on the network, any lands, yeah. you can apply that 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 license to using different profiles and you can have uh, multiple profiles that can be assigned by the firewall to apply to each different subnet so that you can separate it out. So you could like you have have a guest um, subnet or, uh, with one profile and a, a corporate subnet with a different profile, for example. Yeah, it's a good point then actually. I think um, so the product is called Global View for anybody that's not come across it. It's a subscription service and that will give you sort of web content filtering by category. Uh, yeah, well, I'm on the on the right uh, on the right lines there, Alex. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. you um uh d define which categories you want to be blocked um um and then uh, th those categories. You can also have it as a whitelist or a blacklist. Yeah. So you can, if you want to, make it so that the categories you select are the only ones that are permitted, and every other category is allowed. Or you can have it the opposite around that you're uh, allowing access to everything apart from the categories that are blocked. But also, you can have specific uh, websites in a in a whitelist. So if there's a category you want to block, but you specifically want to allow one website from that, then you can uh, can do that as a whitelist override as well. So you've got a bit of flexibility with that. Absolutely. The, the other thing to emphasise there is it's a subscription service that applies to any device, I guess any user that's connected to that particular router using it as a gateway. So it's uh, quite straightforward in terms of licensing. It's not you know, by the amount of users or it's purely by anything that goes via that device, that, that the gateway router. So mm. you pay your subscription once and that covers you for everything basically for a year. So mm. well worth having a look at. It tends, tends to come across uh, very cost effective actually compared to other options. So if you've not taken a look at that, that might be worth taking a look at now. Okay, and final question here is um, to do with VPN teleworker connections. I think some somebody concerned about the security here. Uh, basically, is one-time password option supported for VPN teleworker connections? 
Yes, it, it is um, based on MOTP. I've seen a couple other questions asking about some of the other two-factor authentication methods. For example, someone's mentioned um, Duo, which it doesn't work with. It's what it specifically works with MOTP. I believe we're looking at some of the kind of Google Authenticator methods as well that may be supported in the future. But as it stands currently, it's MOTP, um, and MOTP is built into the smart VPN client as well. So so if you don't mm -hmm. have an MOTP app, you can use a smart VPN client for that, uh, on that. And I can and see- the, uh, Go on, sorry. Uh, no, 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 go on, go on, Jenny. Yeah, I was gonna say that's the, the Draytech um, downloadable client, I, I imagine you're referring to that. Yeah, it is. Sure, yeah, sure. I was gonna say that there's, I can see there's another question that's sort of related to VPN, which is about what's our recommendation on the best option uh, for a, a dialing VPN because there's a few different options. You've got SSL VPN, kind of open VPN, and then there's also IPsec. Um, the, the question is which will get the, the best performance. Um, there's also LTTP with IPsec. So the, the general answer on that is that uh, SSL VPN is quite good, uh, especially on the Fertiline 10 because it's got a lot of horsepower. So we, we've got up to one gig throughput. Uh, the IPsec though will generally get the best performance uh, because it's uh, it's also less load for the client as well. So if you are um, wanting the best performance possible, remote teleworkers on IPsec would be the best. Not LTTP over IPsec because that just adds an extra layer of of, of um, kind of a, another protocol on top. So LTTP over IPsec is not something I'd recommend. I'd just recommend just using just IPsec. The difficulty with IPsec is that sometimes it's not terribly compatible with some network environments. If someone is going around maybe in a, uh, a staying in a hotel or something, SSL VPN is much more likely to get through than IPsec. Right. IPsec should do, but you can sometimes come across issues because typically when people are putting in firewall rules, they're allowing HTTPS traffic, which is what SSL VPN uses, whereas IPsec is slightly different, so it's possible for it to get uh, yeah. a, a kind of not handled correctly by the the guest network you're on. Uh, so it's yeah. kind of a pros and cons of interoperability versus raw performance. How is it generally how, how, I'd, how I'd phrase that? Yeah, it sounds like really good I, advice there. Yeah, go on. Sorry. And I generally recommend using the, the built-in Draytech VPN client rather than the Windows one, primarily because using the Draytech one automates a lot of the things. In the you can do the same thing with the Windows one if you wanted to, but it just you just it's a lot more steps. So so it's a lot easier just use the Draytech client. Uh, it's actually just as a front, it's just really a front skin for the Windows one. It's using the same adapters when it comes to IPsec. Uh, when it comes to SSL VPN though, it's our specific adapter that we're installing. So it needs to be the, the Draytech client if you're using SSL. And again, it's a free download, I believe, just from the website. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, Alex, that's great. I think that completes um, the main questions we got. Um, any, if there's any, anything more for you to add, uh, Alex? Anything you'd like to say before we kind of close off? No, I can see that we've, thank you for all the questions that have been asked during. I can see that uh, uh, we've had, I think, um, uh, Mihai and Lucas on hand to, to, to respond yeah, to you all yeah. directly. And I can see there's been a lot of questions. So, so thank you for all those. That, um, but uh, no, I just wanted to, to say thank you very much for attending today and, and give some feedback on what additional topics you're interested in because uh, it's not been possible to go into deep on all of the functionality of it because there's, there's so much breadth in it, in it that we tried to kind of uh, touch on it. But then um, if, if you want to have some more, then we, we can cover some more specific topics, go into to more detail on those. Well, thank you. Alex. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Alex. A lot of lot of information got across there, all within the hour, which is always good. We always like that from a timekeeping perspective. I see it's now 10.59, so we've maintained our commitment to do this within an hour. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just thank you all for attending today. We really do hope you found that useful. Please do give us your feedback, which helps us on future webinars. And we look forward to uh, seeing you on a webinar sometime soon. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Have a great day. Bye for now.